Hi there, my name is Katrina Jameson. I'm the director of the Sanford Stem Cell Clinical Center and the deputy director of the UC San Diego Moores Cancer Center. And it's really a privilege to be able to introduce our two speakers from today uh, for a closer look. So this is a real opportunity to have a very interactive discussion about precision immunotherapy. And if you look at precision immunotherapy, just do a Google search, precision immunotherapy clinic, you'll see that Dr. Cohen's clinic it comes up first. Uh, so clearly a lot of people are searching the website. Uh, it really is an exciting time in the field where we'll, we're seeing a culmination of science and medicine uh, really in a very rapid succession. And we're able to do what's called reverse translation, which is take what we learn in the clinic and take it back to the bench where Judy Barner will dissect uh, some of the findings from the clinic. So it, it really is a very vital area of research. So I'd like to start by introducing my friend and colleague, um, Professor Ezra Eddy Wysam Cohen. I just found his full name. Anyway, um, Dr. Cohen is really a, a game changer. You know, we recruited him here from the University of Chicago a few years ago. And in that time, he's managed to get three R01s, a U01, uh, started many groundbreaking clinical trials and worked very well with other colleagues to um, really establish a new paradigm for how to treat really advanced malignancies that a lot of people never thought could be treated. And so I see this kind of heroism on a daily basis, thanks to Dr. Cohen's efforts, um, which are really personalized. Patients just expect to have something made for them. So, you know, I see Ezra Cohen more like a tailor. He'll tailor make this bespoke suit for you if you happen to have cancer. And that's going to be one in three of us. A lot of us are going to have more than one cancer. So this is an opportunity to retreat the same malignancy or even a different malignancy in the same person. Um, so this is a very exciting time. It's really a pleasure to introduce Professor Ezra Cohen. Thank you, Ezra, for being here. Thank you. OK, I'll uh, share my screen and um, start my talk. Uh, thanks, Kat, for that wonderful introduction and for the opportunity to um, uh, address the uh, closer look uh, audience. And um, I titled the talk uh, Precision Immunotherapy, A New Era, um, because I think we really are, as you alluded to, uh, Kat, entering a completely new time in the treatment of cancer. And it's, it's really, it's been a pleasure to be an oncologist and, and I think no better time in history uh, to be involved in this. So with that in mind, um, let's review a little bit about where we are in terms of cancer therapy. And here you see the current approaches. Of course, there's been surgery traditionally, and uh, that removes the cancer. Radiation therapy that applies a specific energy to an area, uh, the cancer, the tumor. And then chemotherapy that really consisted up until fairly recently of uh, toxins to the DNA with the advantage being that cancer cells grow uh, faster than um, their the normal counterparts, and therefore a toxin to the cancer DNA should be more effective, and it is. And of course, chemotherapy has been a mainstay of cancer treatment for decades. But now we're asking, can the immune system help control cancer, and in even some cases, do more than that? And, and the answer really does seem to be yes. But before we get into some of the data and certainly the precision approaches that we're taking, um, I really want to remind people that the immune system exists uh, to protect us from infection, not really for cancer. And if we keep that in mind, not only as researchers, but also as uh, lay people interested in the field and, and even as patients, we begin to understand how immunotherapy can be integrated into the cancer treatment paradigms. So with that in mind, we do know that there are two arms, generally, to the immune system, the innate and the adaptive uh, sides, and they really serve two functions that are complementary. The innate immune system is always on. It responds first and it responds quickly within hours. It recognizes features that are common to all viruses and bacteria, not just specific ones, and it really brings the heat or inflammation. And if you think about it, it makes sense because what we really need in our immune system is a way to uh, fight the pathogen, the offender, as quickly as possible. And that's exactly what the innate immune arm does. And, and in fact, actually, the innate immune system is conserved 
um, evolutionarily even to insects. Now, the adaptive arm is, if you will, the more sophisticated part of the immune system. It requires induction and time, that is days to weeks. It, re it recognizes unique features of specific viruses and bacteria. And in fact, this is what allows us to immunize people against uh, mumps or measles or hopefully soon COVID-19 uh, because the adaptive arm recognizes these specific elements or specific uh, sequences in a virus or a bacteria. And then it confers lifelong memory and it really does make the kill uh, in, a, in a very uh, specific way. Now, why are we interested in immunotherapy when it comes to cancer? And I like to show this graph, but let me orient you a little bit if you're not used to seeing these types of curves. The y-axis is the percent of patients who are alive uh, uh, having started with advanced or metastatic cancer. And you can see at the x-axis is time, in this case measured in years. And at the beginning of this graph, um, everybody's alive. But unfortunately, as we track down that red line, patients with advanced cancers, metastatic disease, unfortunately will all end up succumbing to their cancer. Now, with standard therapy, what we've been able to do is we've been able to shift the median or the average person's outcome, where we see that patients take longer to progress, but again, that line eventually goes to zero. What we're excited about when it comes to immunotherapy is that all of a sudden what we're seeing is that the line isn't going to zero, that there are patients that not only have increased survival, but that survival lasts for years. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. But of course, this curve also tells us that there's a long way to go. There's room for improvement. Right now, we're seeing about 15%, maybe optimistically 20% long-term survivors with immunotherapy, but we'd like that number to be 50%, 80%, and who knows, maybe one day, even 100%. And let me illustrate what I mean by this case presentation. Um, this is a 55-year-old gentleman who presented to us um, with an HPV-positive base of tongue cancer I'll note the date. This was September 2015. I'll ask you to remember that. Um, actually, he, this was at an outside institution. He was treated with uh, a drug called cetuximab and radiation therapy. Um, and uh, he completed that without any problems or interruption. On the right side of the screen, you see his PET scan uh, when he presented at his initial diagnosis. And for those of you who aren't used to reading PET scans, uh, orange and red are bad things. Um, so you can see that the tumor is there uh, in the center, and then off to the side is a lymph node that was involved with cancer. Well, the treatment that he was on was meant to cure the cancer so that a PET scan done afterwards is supposed to show no cancer, no orange, red, or yellow. But unfortunately, this is what his PET scan looked like after treatment. You can see that not only is the cancer still there, but it's actually gotten bigger. It now involves almost his entire tongue and it involves both sides of his neck. And so um, this is what we would call, unfortunately, a failure of therapy. And this was confirmed by biopsy. So now he was left with the option of doing surgery to try and remove his cancer. That surgery would have involved a total glossectomy. So his entire tongue would have been removed. And, and most of his throat, and including his voice box. So he wouldn't have been able to eat, he wouldn't have been able to speak, and you can uh, 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 surmise uh, quite rightly that his life would have been altered forever. At that point, he asked his physicians if there were other options, and um, his, the physician that was treating him uh, knew of some of the work that we were doing down at UCSD, and he said, well, let me talk to my colleague um, Dr. Cohen and see if they have anything. And sure enough, I said, well, we do have some interesting trials. We're seeing some, some nice effects already. Uh, and, and this trial in particular that combined um, a PD-1 antibody called pembrolizumab with uh, an IDO inhibitor called epacodostat. Uh, we were already seeing responses in patients with head and neck cancer. And so we enrolled um, this gentleman, the patient, on this study and um, amazingly enough, after he started, um, the first thing he said to me after a few days, he called and he said, um, Dr. Cohen, I think something's wrong.
because my pain is worse. I'm having tr more trouble swallowing. I think the cancer is getting bigger. And I said, well, hold on. It's very unusual for it to have grown this fast um, in just a few days. What we may be seeing is a response, an immune response to your cancer. So let's hold on and, um, and wait and see. Uh, uh, if, and I'll give you some pain medicine. We'll get your, your, that pain under control. You can go on a liquid diet. And um, believe it or not, uh, a couple of weeks after that phone call, he called me back and he said, uh, I haven't taken pain medicine for a few days. I'm swallowing better than I have in many months. And I think I just coughed up my tumor. And, and lo and behold, this was his PET scan done nine weeks after starting. And I think he was right. I think he did cough up his tumor because you can see clearly that there's much less yellow now. Um, the lymph node is gone and the tumor is much smaller. This was his PET scan on July 12th of 2016 now showing no evidence of cancer. He's, he was asymptomatic at that point with actually no toxicity from the drugs. And believe it or not, he has remained disease-free for all this time. Now we're over four years. That gentleman, his name is Ricky Rocket. Uh, his story is public. And in, and in fact, we, um, we were in People Magazine, um, this picture of, of Ricky and I, uh, when he was declared disease-free uh, in, uh, in that PET scan. And as I said, he's remained that way for over four years. Not only has he remained that way, but some of you may recognize the name because he's the drummer for a band called Poison. And he has gone on, they've gone on to do uh, two tours uh, since his uh, diagnosis of what many of us would have considered a terminal cancer. Um, they were actually supposed to go on tour this summer but unfortunately, uh, COVID hit and, and that, that was canceled. So I can tell you that Ricky is doing exceptionally well. Well, we've learned a lot about immunotherapy and cancer, and, and it's based on, uh, again, this physiology of how our immune system responds to a pathogen, but it also translates into cancer. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but we know that there are several steps that uh, need to happen for our immune system to actually eliminate a cancer. And, and you, can, you can guess that it's quite a complicated process um, and many things can go wrong along the way. But at the same time, we can influence this at, at each of those steps. And here in green are ways that we can actually um, induce an immune response uh, using the, uh, the system, the physiologic system. And in red, are elements that we can inhibit within the system that can actually help the immune system fight cancer. And what you see at the bottom is this PD-1, PD-L1 um, that we used uh, in, in Ricky's case. And over the last few years, we have now had multiple approvals in this country for immunotherapy in multiple cancers. Uh, this is not meant to be read uh, verbatim. The point of this slide is that um, immunotherapy has been applied to almost every cancer we're treating, uh, literally from head to toe, including head and neck cancer, um, lymphomas, uh, lung cancer, kidney cancer, so a wide array of uh, different uh, malignancies uh, that, that we encounter. But the question now becomes, well, how do we get better? Uh, what, what can we do to take big steps forward to try and further improve those outcomes? change that curve that I showed you earlier. We embarked on a research endeavor that um, really attempted to personalize and has done that um, and do it through cancer vaccines. And we asked a few very uh, simple questions early on because we understood that we had to, the, the requirements were that we had, had to identify mutations in each patient's tumor that were recognized by their own T cells. And we call those neoantigens. Before we embarked on this, we actually didn't know if this was even possible. And I can tell you that, that indeed it is. I'll show you that in just a second. And then we had to develop an effective vaccine strategy to direct these neoantigen-specific T cells. So these T cells that are, that are recognizing the cancer, we had to retrain to eradicate the cancer. And this was our approach. We started, of course, with the patient and the tumor sample. 
We did sequencing of both the DNA and the RNA, and this is now fairly straightforward. We identified the mutations and then used a bioinformatic algorithm that we have iteratively improved along the way to identify these immunogenic mutations, that is, mutations that the person's cancer might actually respond to. We then took a sample of the patient's blood. We created peptides to represent the mutations. We mixed those together in a co-culture. And what we did was we came up with a way to verify these as, in fact, neoantigens. So now we have a functional approach that tells us exactly what a person's immune system is responding to within their cancer. And in fact, that approach turns out to be about 10 times better than anything that had been previously reported. And we have now done this in multiple cancers. You see uh, uh, many of them listed here. In fact, we've done this in cancers where others um, thought it was not possible, such as uh, glioblastoma, a brain tumor, and uh, pancreatic uh, ductal adenocarcinoma, which is uh, uh, unfortunately uh, very serious and, and often deadly. And we've been able to do this now in patients. Here you see patient number one, um, and you'll, you'll note the date is, uh, is now about two years ago. Uh, and here you, uh, I'm giving the vaccine. You see a couple of my colleagues, Dr. Steven Schoenberger and Dr. Aaron Miller with the beard. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, Ta uh, Tamara's mother, uh, Iris Strauss, uh, standing behind her. And, and Tamara is about to get uh, the first ever uh, personalized vaccine that comes out of this approach. Here's the clinical trial that we undertook. Uh, you can see that what we do is, uh, again, we sequence the cancer, we identify the neoantigens. It does take about uh, 12 weeks uh, to make the vaccine um, throughout this whole process, even sometimes a little bit longer than that. And then we eventually uh, get to treat patients in combination with a drug called pembrolizumab, uh, which helps the T cells do their job when they get to their tumor. And amazingly enough, we've seen uh, some pretty remarkable results. The first results I'll show you actually is patient number one. So the, this, this is Tamara's tumor. We immunized uh, her against three neoantigens. There you see listed at the bottom, MEN1, EP300, and HLA DQA2. The blue bars are her tumor biopsy before the vaccine. And the red bars are her tumor biopsy after nine weeks of the vaccine. And what we see is that those, the two of the three mutations that we vaccinated her, uh, her immune system, we stimulated her immune system, are now gone. One of the mutations is still there, and, and we don't know why that didn't disappear, but two of the three were actually gone in the post-vaccine biopsy. We saw this as well in another patient. This is patient number five, where again, he, this is a gentleman who received uh, five uh, uh, peptides in the vaccine. So we immunized against five different neoantigens. And what you can see is that four of the five actually disappeared, again, in the biopsy that we took after the three doses of the vaccine. Well, both those patients actually did fairly well on the vaccine. And, and in fact, what we've also seen, and this is in, again, patient number five, is that we're seeing T cell responses against the epitopes, against the mutations that we're immunizing against. Uh, here you see them represented by um, the bars going up in the post-vaccine graph. Uh, these are the, the colors represent the different types of T cells that we want to induce, either CD8 or CD4. And you can see that we're effectively inducing this type of immune response that's very specific for the mutations in that person's cancer. And lastly, what we were really amazed to see is that we're seeing clinical responses in these patients. This is patient number four, a patient with head and neck cancer. You can see his tumor outlined in March of 2019 before he was vaccinated. And then three months later in June, almost a 90% disappearance. Here's another cut of his CT scan and you can see the lesions on his chest wall that are almost completely gone after uh, three months on the vaccine study. Well, we weren't perfect and we still aren't, and we, we realized we had a lot more to do, 
you'll recall that some of the mutations that we were immunizing against did not disappear. And so we began to look in the laboratory and ask ourselves, well, how can we be better? And we decided that there were a few things that we could introduce. One was a more effective adjuvant, that is a way to further stimulate the immune system uh, to uh, respond to the vaccine. And we did that with a drug called Hiltonol. The other thing we decided to do was increase the number of neoantigens in the vaccine. We, were, we started with a limit of five, but we thought, well, there are clearly more than five mutations in a person's cancer. And if we could increase that number to immunize against more, we might have a more dramatic effect. And so we did, we did that. And in addition to that, we um, actually changed the schema a little bit where we introduced a priming of the vaccine where we gave three quick doses one week apart and then a much longer boost that lasted approximately 20 weeks in total, thinking that if we could boost the immune system initially and then prolong the duration of the vaccine, we might get an even better effect. And that's exactly what we saw in the first patient that was treated on this new schema or revised protocol. This is a patient with pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer who had just had pembrolizumab. And so uh, it's hard, it would be difficult to say that this was an effect of the pembrolizumab. And what we saw, in fact, was that her tumors began to shrink in her liver. There you see going from about five centimeters to 4.4, and the other one also getting smaller, uh, On and this is on uh, a couple of different cuts. So early on, we're beginning to see clinical responses in these patients, and the other testing we're now embarking on regarding mutations disappearing and the specific T cell responses. The last thing I'd like to share with you is, uh, and Kat uh, mentioned it uh, early on, is that we did, in, in an effort to try and solidify all these efforts, not only with the vaccine study, but with many other clinical trials that we have going on, Judy, uh, I think, will talk to you about some of uh, one other study and, and some of the mechanisms that, we'll, that we're trying to interrupt. Uh, we decided to create a precision immunotherapy clinic where we would see patients we would um, uh, phenotype or, or uh, analyze their tumor, and we would try to select a treatment, be it the vaccine or something else, that was specific to their cancer and, and their cancer biology and what their immune system was telling us with respect to that response. That clinic is now uh, open. Uh, it covers all cancers, and we're seeing uh, now several patients every week in the precision immunotherapy clinic. Let me leave you with a few thoughts that the era of cancer immunotherapy is definitely here, um, that there are some agents that have an established role in multiple cancers. I showed you that, uh, that graphic. Checkpoint blockade and other immune modulators are being tested now in every cancer. And that immunotherapy can potentially cure patients, even with metastatic disease. We are seeing patients who really, in a different uh, time, would have been dead from their cancer that are alive four, five, even 10 years later, and believe it or not, cancer-free. But we have a lot of questions still and a lot of work to do. We have to begin to uh, make personalized immunotherapy more effective. I showed you one strategy, but there is a lot more to go. And Judy actually will talk a little bit about that. We need to better define biomarkers that can predict who will benefit from different types of uh, immunotherapies. And we need to understand how to treat refractory patients. Moreover, we need to make these approaches more available. The Precision Immunotherapy Clinic was an attempt to do that, but we need to shorten timelines from evaluating a patient to actually treating them. We need to improve distribution of not only the vaccine, but immunotherapy in general. And of course, we need to lower the cost so that it can be available, not just uh, in the US, but across the world. Thank you very much again for the invitation to talk. Thanks, Kat, for the lovely introduction and, and, and facilitating this. And um, I'll be happy to stay around and take questions at the end. 
Okay, well, thank you so much, Ezra. That was really illuminating as always. Uh, we have two very quick questions just before we switch to Dr. Varner's talk. Will HMOs cover the costs at your clinic? Um, so in general, the answer is yes. Of course, it depends on the specific HMO. Uh, what we found with HMOs is that for patients who have had standard therapy and it, it didn't work or it stopped working, um, the HMOs have actually been very good about allowing referrals as long as, of course, the treating oncologist um, uh, is, uh, is amenable to that. And we see many patients with uh, that type of insurance. So in general, the answer is yes. Of course, uh, the, the uh, logistics and, and the specifics uh, sometimes need to be worked out. The second question is, do you see any differences in alpha beta T cell receptor driven T cells compared to gamma delta T cells? So it's a good. So that came from an immunologist. Uh, I would say so. <laughs> um, so uh, the 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 real answer is I don't know. We have focused on alpha beta, uh, and we've we focused on those um, on cloning those TCRs and looking for for the responses there. Um, uh, we haven't focused on gamma delta. Uh, others have. Uh, others at UCSD have. Um, it's just not been work that we've done. So. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it's a great question. We should explore it. And I have a question, you know, we'll leave the other questions to the end, but is there any evidence of T cell energy or T cell exhaustion as a result of this priming with pembrolizumab combined with the peptide vaccine strategy? I, let me just say, we think that that will likely happen. And that's the reason we extended the vaccine. Um, we haven't documented it, although, uh, we've collected the samples to do that. But, um, but Kat, you're, you're pointing out something that um, uh, if it happens and it likely will, will eventually lead to, uh, to growth of the cancer if it isn't sterilized initially. So, it, so it's something we're definitely mindful of and, and uh, need to find ways to grapple with it. It's great, uh, great, great thought. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Ezra. That was Thanks. really great. Um, I'm using that as a segue for Dr. Judith Varner. Judith Ann Varner is a professor of pathology here at UC San Diego. She's really made seminal discoveries regarding uh, macrophages that infiltrate tumors. Macrophages are the garbage trucks for our immune system and has published widely, including in Nature, has three R01s, you know, it's really at the forefront of the field when it comes to myeloid immunity. So we've heard from Dr. Cohen about the adaptive T cell responses here's the missing piece uh, that and they collaborate very nicely together so um, we'd like to hear more Judy about your um, groundbreaking work thank you so much Kat and <clears throat> for that great introduction and um, really looking forward to telling you today about our work so I'd like to tell you today about the other aspect of precision immune therapy that Kat and Ezra both mentioned um, and this is collaborative work with Dr. Cohen uh, here at the Moore's Cancer Center. And our work is focused on immune therapy approaches to control macrophages in cancer. Now, macrophages are the soldiers of the immune system. They're on the ground, they're doing the work, but they can cause problems. So ordinarily here on the left, you see a pro-inflammatory macrophage. This is a cell that's exquisitely designed to combat viruses and bacteria, as Dr. Cohen mentioned. And they also can um, alert the body to a mutated uh, cancer cell. They are similar to the infantry of the army. They are on the ground, they're interacting, at, alerting the um, T cells and leading to an effective response. But on the other hand, we have anti-inflammatory macrophages. These are wound healing macrophages that are designed to clean up and repair all the damage that's done in the process of clearing up an infection or a cancer. But they can cause a lot of problems. So they are similar to the Army Corps of Engineers who build bridges, repair roads, build uh, dikes, and so they do uh, mostly repair work. But the problem in cancer is that there are too many of those and not enough of the foot soldiers. So macrophages can promote inflammatory diseases as well as cancer. The pro-inflammatory disease-fighting macrophage 
can become uh, overactivated as it is happening in coronavirus 19 disease. So um, in coronavirus in the normal lung, you have a few macrophages that are there to survey for pathogens. But in the case of coronavirus, you have too many macrophages. They're producing too many factors that cause damage to the lung, even in the absence of a continued virus infection. And this is what is often causing patients to die. Macrophages can play important roles in development. They can help establish new blood vessels. Here on the left, you can see a beautiful macrophage in a developing uh, retina that leads to the proper establishment of blood vessels. And so these cells are very important, but they exist in two different states. They can promote tumor growth. Primarily these, uh, blood these macrophages that stimulate blood vessel growth. And what you can see in a normal pancreas, for example, you see very few of these brown stained cells, which are macrophages, but in a pancreas cancer, you see a huge abundance of these brown stained macrophages. Clearly they are not, um, it's not a normal tissue. And in what we have found is that these cells are not uh, helpful in this disease. One of the things you can do is ask whether the presence of these macrophages is associated with survival and disease. So if we look at the protein expression of the macrophage marker CD68, we can see that the more protein of CD68 that you have in your pancreatic tumor, the worse the survival. So survival is measured here as a percent of patients alive at any time. And so you see that over time, those with more CD68 are living less uh, uh, long. That can also be seen by looking at the gene expression of CD68. The more CD68 expression, the poorer the survival. So clearly macrophages play a role in cancer, but uh, at the moment they mainly play a deleterious role. They normally work together with T cells to fight disease. Dr. Cohen and um, Katrina both mentioned this. It, so macrophages are part of the innate immune system, and there are quite a few cells that all are developing from the same progenitor stem cell, but um, they interact with the adaptive immune system, which is comprised of B cells and T cells, to facilitate their activation and to specify what antigens they interact with. However, in cancer, uh, this doesn't happen appropriately. So one of the problems in cancer is there's not enough activated killer T cells. Killer T cells are these beautiful cells that attach to a cancer cell. And as you can see here, and inject toxic molecules called perforins and granzymes into the cancer cell, causing it to die. And the problem in cancer generally is there are not enough of these. The strategies that Dr. Cohen described are designed to activate T cells. And we're interested in understanding why there are not enough T cells in cancer. Some cancers have a lot of T cells present within them and they're called hot or inflamed tumors. And that's, for example, the case with an HPV positive head and neck tumor. These respond pretty well to checkpoint inhibitors but there are mo many other tumors. In fact, most other tumors are not uh, inflamed and they're considered cold. They have either T cells stuck at the edge of the tumor or there are no T cells at all. And so we and others have asked, what is the cause of this? And what we find is it's often because these are filled with macrophages. Now, checkpoint inhibitors that Dr. Cohen mentioned, anti-PD-1, nivolumab, for example, or anti-CTLA-4 ipilimumab can be used to reestablish an anti-tumor T cell response. But in the presence of macrophages, this response is inhibited. So why is that? Well, these macrophages in cancer are far too much like these anti-inflammatory wound healing repair macrophages. So they're constantly building bridges, digging ditches, 
um, laying down roads that help the tumor to grow instead of attracting the disease-fighting cells. So these cells can um, very rapidly accumulate in tumors. Seen here, this is a yellow macrophage, and it they can stimulate the growth of blood vessels that can allow the tumor to grow and also to escape and to metastasize. That can lead to a tumor that looks like this. It's got lots of blood vessels. They are very leaky. And then the tumor cells can escape and go to other organs. So um, we have asked, how can we study these? So we can study them in tissues, as I showed you before, by immunohistochemistry. But we can also grow tumors in mice. We can chop up or dissociate the tumor into single cells and then study these cells by biomarkers on the surface using a strategy called flow cytometry. And then we can separate them into different populations and examine how they are impacting the tumor. What kinds of molecules do they express? And this is an example of gene expression analysis. So what we find is that macrophages and tumors express large numbers of immune suppressive factors. Arginase is a molecule that kills T cells. IL-10 and TGF-beta inhibit T cell function and so on. We find there are no immune stimulatory molecules that actually activate T cells. So how can we study this further? Uh, in my lab, Hideyuka Takahashi and Paulina Pathria used a new technology called CYTOF or time of flight mass cytometry. This is a way that we can separate cells into single cells. They're labeled with antibodies that are conjugated to different metals. We can actually use up to 40 or 60 different antibodies to characterize all the cells in a tumor. We then basically blast the cells so that we can uh, remove the, all the organic material and all we do is survey these metals. That allows us to use computation to identify all the different cell types in a tumor. And here you can see an example. We have different kinds of T cells. We have N natural killer cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and tumor cells. So when we did that in tumors growing over time, we find that the majority of the cells in a tumor are actually macrophages in red. What you can see here in a normal tissue, you've got a few macrophages present in black are the normal cells. After four days, there's a huge increase in macrophages. And in green, you see T cells. But So you see very few T cells coming into the tumor. By day seven, you see even more macrophages. You see some brown and natural killer cells, more T cells. But then at day 14, you see now that macrophages are overwhelming all the other cells and the natural killer cells and the T cells are going away. So we asked, how can we inhibit these macrophages from getting into the tumor or from causing this uh, immune suppression? Can we block their accumulation at this step? Or once they're in there, can we change their polarization or their gene expression profile so that they will be pro-inflammatory and recruit and activate T cells? So uh, first we ask, how do they get into tumors? Are they coming from the bone marrow? And I'm showing you this old video to show you that normally myeloid cells and other leukocytes are flowing through the bloodstream and they're never sticking to the blood vessel wall. You see just this huge rush of cells, but occasionally you see some cells here that are actually sticking to the blood vessel wall and going into the tissue. And here we have reproduced this in in vitro in the test tube, and we have given these cells a substance called a chemokine that makes them stop and adhere or stick to the surface of the blood vessel wall. And so that is what we uh, have discovered in my lab. Back in 2011, Michael Schmidt, a postdoc in the lab who's now a professor in England, uh, asked whether there was a mechanism that allowed these macrophage progenitor cells to leave the blood vessels attached to the blood vessel wall and enter the tumor. So he asked, what are the molecules on the surface of cells that allow that to happen? And what are the molecules that are produced by the tumor that make that happen? And so um, what we 
found out is there are warning flares, which are called chemokines and cytokines that are released by the tumor. They can be called stromal derived factor, um, uh, CCL2 or macrophage chemoattractant protein um, that can make these cells stop flowing, stick to the blood vessel wall and enter the tumor. So Michael asked, what are the other molecules that are regulating this process? And he created this assay where he labeled macrophages or their progenitors with a green dye. He allowed them to attach to endothelial cells and in a tube. And you can see that they attach very well, but only in the presence of those warning flares, uh, molecules like chemokines. He then asked, what are the cell surface proteins that are involved? And he identified several integrins, they're called. There is a specific kind of cell adhesion protein. And so what he found is that only in the presence of these warning flare molecules do these integrins unfold so that they can attach to the blood vessel wall. And the, you can think of it like this. The integrins are like flat tires in the cells flowing through the blood vessel, but only when they get a, pumped up by these chemokine signals do they actually allow the cells to roll along and travel into the blood vessel. And so he found a single molecule that regulates this process, which is an enzyme called PI3 kinase gamma. Um, and so we found that PI3 kinase gamma is exclusively regulating this process, allowing these integrins to be activated and enter the tissue. He characterized this entire signaling pathway, and it happens in nanoseconds. Once PI3 kinase gamma is activated by these chemokines and warning flare signals, all of these molecules interact very quickly to cause the integrin to unfold and attach to the endothelium. That leads to the recruitment of cells into inflammatory tissues and tumors. We asked then in coronavirus, for example, can we see PI3 kinase gamma in macrophages in the lungs of patients? And indeed we can. So here you see um, in this inflamed lung, a lot of CD68 positive macrophages in the alveolar spaces, and they all express PI3 kinase gamma. Now, importantly, we asked, can we inhibit this process by knocking out the gene for PI3 kinase gamma or using an inhibitor? And indeed, we found that we can inhibit this inflammatory process by knocking out PI3 kinase gamma. Here we have macrophages seen in a flow cytometry profile, and this whole population are macrophages. In this PI3 kinase gamma knockout animal, we have very, very few macrophages, and that can be graphed like this. This also happens if you inhibit with an and a specific inhibitor. So by blocking this inflammation, we can reduce uh, recruitment to tumors and we can also block cancer growth as I'll show you in a minute. So PI3 kinase gamma is a really unique molecule. One reason is it's only expressed in macrophages and just a few other cell types. It's not widely expressed, so it's a good target for therapy but it's also different from every other molecule. Now, there are some related molecules called uh, class 1A PI3 kinases, and they're found mostly in other cell types. But PI3 kinase gamma is unique, and Michael uh, Schmidt characterized exactly how it's activated in this process. He found that it requires the binding of a molecule called RAS to the to this domain of this molecule. This is a crystal structure of the molecule. And having this crystal structure allows one to develop a highly selective small molecule inhibitor. This is a crystal structure of the molecule ATP in the binding site. And this is the basis for small molecule inhibitors. So working together with Infinity Pharmaceuticals of Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, we helped them to develop a very highly selective inhibitor of PI3 kinase gamma called IPI549. Using this inhibitor in knockout animals, 
we were able to show as a team, these different people contributed to this work, that if you inject tumor cells into an animal, a tumor will grow. If you knock out P. kinase gamma or you treat the animals with this inhibitor, the tumors will be much smaller. We can show that graphically here by um, showing the size of the tumor on this y-axis over time. And in particular, you can see with this HPV positive head and neck tumor that the tumors hardly grow. And in fact, over time, they shrink and disappear. While in the control animals, which have normal PI3 kinase gamma, the tumors continue to grow. The drug IPI549 also causes this strong inhibition of tumor growth. Now, we've seen this uh, effect in a lot of different types of cancers and models. We've seen it in HPV positive and negative head and neck cancer, non small cell lung carcinoma, triple negative breast carcinoma, melanoma, pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma, neuroendocrine tumors, and ovarian cancer. So um, on the basis of this, um, we asked whether this could be combining with checkpoint inhibitors and other immune therapeutics. Uh, so we, in this particular experiment, Megan Kanita in my lab combined anti-PD-1, which is also known as nivolumab or Optivo or Pembrolizumab or Keytruda, together with PI3 kinase gamma inhibition in the knockout mouse or with the IPI549 drug, and what we saw was a tremendous uh, synergy, an increase in survival in these animals. So if we don't treat animals, they all die within about 50 days after tumor implantation. Uh, if we just treat with the anti-PD-1, they'd all die by 60 days. But if we, if we treat by inhibiting PI3 kinase gamma, there's somewhat better survival. But if we combine them, we get almost complete survival. And if we look at the tumor regression, we can see almost complete regression by this combination therapy. So we wanted to know how this works. What exactly is happening besides blocking some macrophages from getting in tumors? So Megan uh, undertook a number of studies that led us to conclude that PI3 kinase gamma inhibition not only suppresses some of the macrophages from getting into tumors, but switches them from being anti-inflammatory to pro-inflammatory. So they're no longer the Army Corps of Engineers, but they're now the foot soldiers that can work with T cells to cause a good immune response. And we did gene expression profiling shown here. The blue bars show low expression, the red bars show high expression. And what we found was a strong signature of T cell activation and of antigen presentation. So it really is showing that the innate immune system, which presents antigens, is interacting with the adaptive immune system, the T cells, to promote an effective immune response. That leads to killer T cell recruitment and eradication of tumors by T cells. Now, Megan figured out a signaling pathway that leads to this process. And for those of you who are interested in signaling, what she found is that PI3 kinase gamma normally activates an AKT mTOR pathway that leads to transcription factor activation that leads to immune suppression. At the same time, it's blocking NF-kappa B activation. And if you inhibit PI3 kinase, however, you block this pathway of immune suppression gene expression, and you stimulate and sustainably stimulate NF-kappa B so that you get pro-inflammatory factor expression that activates T cells. And this was published in Nature a few years ago. As a result of all of this work, Infinity Pharmaceuticals developed IPI549 and has had it in the clinic for a few years, and I'd like to summarize some of the results. It's a first-in-class orally active and selective inhibitor of PI3 kinase gamma. This is its structure. It has a very strong binding affinity for this one isoform of PI3 kinases and very little activity on others. 
and it's very active in cells in in vivo. Now they've had it into several different clinical trials and uh, Dr. Cohen is the PI of one of these clinical trials here at UCSD Cancer Center. Uh, they did a, a series of phase one safety trials and phase one B expansion trials that were safety trials combined with a biomarker analysis. Uh, so essentially the original trials included monotherapy to test safety and determine whether the drug by itself had, had any effect. And then the combination trials looked at the effect of this drug together with nivolumab, the anti-PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor. The drug was tested in various tumors, lung, melanoma, head and neck, breast cancer, uh, mesothelioma, and um, colon cancer. And they were in generally tested with patients that had already been on checkpoint inhibitor and had, had not responded to it. So the early trials show that it has promise as an immune therapeutic. Most of the patients experienced stable disease or partial responses in the earliest trials. There's strong evidence of a decreased immune suppressive macrophage presence in circulation, and there is absolute evidence of increased T cell activation in circulation. So these results have been published, but I'd like to tell you a little more. So this drug restores T cell activation um, by taking previously exhausted T cells and now making them uh, activated. You can see that here and that there's an increase in the proliferative cells, these cells um, that express KI67, a marker of proliferation. These are the killer T cells that are circulating in the blood. And so you can see in the patients treated with this drug that there are many more of these proliferative T cells. And that is true whether they were on the study for 16 weeks or whether their tumor showed a decrease. Um, as a result of these studies, there are now several clinical trials ongoing um, and uh, things are looking pretty good. So we have, there are trials in renal cancer, triple negative breast cancer in combination with different strategies, urothelial cancer and third line resistant uh, solid tumor cancers. So what we found is that by studying macrophages, we have identified a molecular mechanism that could be targeted. This has been developed into a therapeutic that is showing promise to help to enhance existing checkpoint inhibitor immune therapy and is um, moving forward into the advanced clinical trials. Uh, we are also currently investigating whether this drug can be effective in coronavirus therapy because it's blocking the recruitment of macrophages into tissues and it is repolarizing them so that they promote an effective T cell response. So we have these studies ongoing in collaboration with Infinity Pharmaceuticals. So how can we inhibit macrophage accumulation to promote long-term regression? Can we block trafficking or proliferation? Well, yes, IPI549 can do this. Can we repolarize them? Again, this drug is very effective at repolarizing macrophages. And will that synergize with T-cell targeted therapy? And again, this drug can do that. So we look forward to the future uh, results of the clinical trials and to continued research in macrophage biology. And I'd just like to thank the members of my lab who did all of this work and my collaborator collaborators at Infinity Pharmaceuticals. Thank you all very much. Okay, well, thank you so much, Judy, for just a fantastic talk, as always. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, there's still a number of questions we didn't quite get to for Ezra Cohen, who is back here as well. Uh, so we expect a fairly robust discussion um, from these very provocative talks. And you can see why I was asking about the T cell exhaustion part when Ezra gave his talk, because I was trying to suggest very subtly that you may want to use your IPI 549 um, with his peptide vaccine strategy and Pembro or something. We'd, we'd love to. That's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Just say uh, Anyway, I can imagine how effective that combination would be. It's really exciting. Um, so there are questions for Ezra here. Um, so I'll just 
go back to where we were for Ezra. Um, so DNA mismatch repair cancer, such as Lynch syndrome, downregulate HLA class one. And we saw from Judy's data, they actually increased beta 2M expression in class one essentially. So that's why I'm go harping on about this. Um, and accumulate and inactiv inactivating mutations in beta 2 microglobulin a coding microsatellite, and that allows the tumors to evade immunoediting in the tumor. Um, but not in the circulation. Would you comment on the bigger picture of how this works since DMMR tumors are usually very responsive to ICB? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because the other uh, elements, so, so first of all, um, uh, th that's true, although uh, many um, microsatellite uh, unstable or, or DNA repair defect in general, um, uh, tumors continue to express uh, class one and, and so, um, in, in some of them, the antigen presenting machinery is lost, and that's a challenge. Uh, by the way, that's often lost um, epigenetically rather than actually mutated. It can be mutated, but epigenetically, in some patients, it can be restored. Um, but that's, that's an aside. Um, however, having said that, uh, the unique thing about especially microsatellite uh, unstable tumors is that um, they tend to um, form a lot of frame shift mutations. And what we learned along the way is frame shift mutations make very good antigens uh, for uh, some reason, and it's probably because it's, it's truly a completely different um, uh, uh, protein that gets synthesized eventually. Um, they become, they're almost always show up in our neoantigen identification. And so um, the two are linked. Their responsiveness to anti-PD-1, I think, is because of that, because they have these immunogenic um, uh, alterations. Uh, and at the same time, they actually make uh, very good uh, vaccine candidates. I hope that answers the question. I think so. And also I had a question about splice isoforms. If you see splice isoforms switching, does that represent a new antigenic target? Do you see- It something should. Uh, the truth is we have not explored that. Um, interestingly, we're beginning to um, uh, explore that and, and, and Kat, I need to get you on board uh, with this because you're really the world's expert there, but, um, uh, but, but they should, we, we just haven't, yeah, we, we, that's a part that we haven't looked at yet. So there's a very interesting question here about neoantigens, whether you collect them for the primary tumor or a metastatic site and are they different? Yeah. Uh, so, so we, we asked that question, uh, really early on. Um, the simple answer is uh, there are differences, but most of uh, the uh, mutations and most of the new antigens overlap. Uh, in our experience, is about 80%, 80. Um, there are exceptions to that. There, we've seen a couple of patients where the, we create these Venn diagrams, where a couple of patients where the Venn diagrams have, have barely um, uh, overlapped. But for most patients, it's, it's about 80% between the primary and, and metastatic and over time as well. So you can talk about heterogeneity in a spatial way, uh, but you can also talk about it in a temporal way. And even over time, the new antigens seem to, be, to overlap uh, a fair bit. Very interesting. Uh, here's a question for Judy. What other phenotypes do the PI3 kinase gamma mice have? You know, the, they're actually fairly healthy. There's no overt uh, toxicities. But if you look really carefully, there are potential other roles for PI3 kinases. Uh, uh, Emilio Hirsch in um, Torino, Italy, has explored this in great detail as he made the first knockout mouse. And uh, he's identified roles for PI3 kinase gamma in the heart uh, muscle function. Mm -hmm. So um, if mice are, so essentially it's, not clear because we never see a problem with our mice, but he's looking at that. And then um, uh, there are a lot of benefits to inhibiting PI3 kinase gamma, actually, because it can promote vascular leak in endothelial cells. And so inhibiting it actually is fairly useful in almost every kind of disorder, inflammatory or um, cardiovascular disorder. And then other, there are no overt uh, immune cell problems such as T cells or B cells. So it's fairly safe. And the drug itself has proven to be extremely safe. 
Yeah, I had a question because there are you know different ways to target this, but um, specifically about CD forty seven, the "Don't Eat Me" signal, and that that allows macrophages to just go on by when tumors upregulate CD forty seven. Is there an interplay between PI three kinase gamma and CD forty seven expression? Have you ever looked at that, considering the breakthrough therapy designation for CD forty seven inhibition by forty seven A? Yeah, we have not really looked at that yet. Um, mm -hmm. But it's definitely an interesting question. Uh, you know, we have looked at many other kind of combinations, uh, but not yet that one. So uh, also, just to, sorry, I, I see a number of questions lining up here. Apobec 3, I noticed that was downregulated. That's very interesting. Speaking of editing, Ezra alluded to immunoediting, but that's an actual DNA editase. It's a, a, a you know, a C to T deaminase. What do you make of that in your data set? Truly don't know, been meaning to ask you what you think uh, because it's very consistent and um, potentially related to the uh, an effective antigen presentation response. So I think it would be very worth to look at that. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, so we have more questions here. Any comment on the category of neoantigen? This is for Ezra with respect to cell surface cytosol or nuclear proteins. Yeah, we, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Uh, again, um, we're looking at a functional readout. Uh, what we uh, what we put in the assay are um, we we base it mostly on expression uh, and um, and some other things that we've learned along the way. But but yeah, the 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 function of the protein that's altered does not matter. Uh, and if you think about it. Um, the immune system doesn't care. Uh, the immune system is is really designed to look for differences, to look for non-self. It, it doesn't care if, if it's a driver. It doesn't care if it's a nuclear uh, protein. It, it it really if it's designed to look for things that are different. I think this is a question that could be posed to both of you, um, to Judy and to Ezra. What is the secret sauce here? Why have you been successful when large pharma hasn't? What is the difference? Uh, I, I guess I can speak to, uh, we, uh, we really study, we have the, you know, the goal of academic medicine is to study mechanism. And that is, you know, if we don't do that, then we're not being successful. So we study mechanism and then we really, especially here at the Morris Cancer Center, try to turn that into translational and then clinical research. And so I think we have good teams for doing that, but in part it's that the, the balance of all of those objectives. And I don't think that pharma has the ability to really go into all of those things so in such detail. Yeah, and I, I would add uh, uh, the collaboration um, is is phenomenal here. It's it's really a unique environment when it comes to that. Uh, uh, Judy and I have worked together. Um, the work on I, I showed you the picture of uh, Steve Schoenberger, who's at a completely different institution uh, now. That institution is is just about ten minutes away, but he's at La Jolla Institute, and um, and it's I think it's just the culture of of this community to be collaborative, to try and work together, to to make us all better. The other thing about the, the neoantigen approach is that when we talk about uh, bespoke therapy um, and, and truly, truly individualized, that, that breaks some of the paradigm of big pharma and the dogma um, that they operate under, that is uh, try to make a drug that uh, serves uh, hundreds of thousands, uh, the more, the more, the better. We're really doing it the other way. We're, we're asking uh, what, what's the biology and let's make a drug based on that biology rather than let's take a drug and try to fit it to as many people as possible. Uh, so so it's, it's a bit of a different paradigm that we're, we're exploring. Mm -hmm. and this one's for Dr. Barner. Can you discuss the role of regulatory T cells in the interaction between macrophages M2 or M1 in terms of recruiting other infiltrating T cells? Yeah, so uh, in general, in these um, aggressively growing tumors, we see that the macrophages are what you call M2-like, they're highly immune suppressive and they're, they're secreting molecules like arginase, uh, IL-10, TGF-beta that inhibit uh, CD8 positive T cells 
and actually um, uh, stimulate uh, FOXP3 regulatory T cells. And so what we find is when we repolarize the macrophages by re we reduce the total content and then the macrophages are repolarized, they now produce a lot of IL-12 and they no longer produce TGF beta and um, IL-10 and arginase. And so what we see in the T cells is the number of regulatory T cells strongly declines and the number of activated uh, CDA positive T cells increases significantly. We believe that is in part because we're um, the, the newly repolarized macrophages are producing chemokines like CXCL9 and CXCL10 that are particularly good at recruiting T cells. Mm -hmm. um, so on the one hand, you're changing the microenvironment of the tumor to make it not so immune suppressive. It doesn't favor regulatory T cells, but you're also then recruiting more T cells. We also have data that we strongly stimulate T cell memory, which yeah. can lead to a, a long-term beneficial effect. And we can um, uh, increase this, the spread of antigens that are recognized by the T cells. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. all part of the benefit of that particular strategy. There's another question for you, Judy. Do you see a significant increase in T cells by the PI3 uh, kinase gamma inhibitor? On the other hand, macrophages are considered as a late inflammatory factor, but in your animal model, macrophage localization takes on um, a, its role in the earlier stages. Is this just an animal model related effect or is that something you see in people as well? Uh, you know, I think that macrophages are, are definitely associated with tumor initiation and early mm -hmm. stages of tumor growth. For example, they're very clearly associated with the initiation of colon carcinoma where pro-inflammatory macrophages appear to be playing a role in initiating cancer by causing a lot of damage. Uh, and then the, but then the, um, there's probably a balance between the initiation and the fighting it off. And then once the tumor starts to grow, the macrophages are very uh, immune suppressive. So um, we don't really see them as a late inflammatory factor, but often more of a causative factor so that the uh you know they also are a causative factor in a lot of diseases so understanding how they tick is really going to be probably the basis for a lot of uh, new therapy for many diseases so along those lines does pi3 kinase gamma inhibition affect uh, microglia in the same way that affects macrophages and might one be worried about shifting microglia to an inflammatory response which could potentiate brain malignancy and might also promote neurodegeneration? Well, I don't think it does. So uh, we have done uh, studies where it's currently uh, under revision for publication together with Clark Chen, who used to be at UCSD, now is at the University of Minnesota. And um, we see a very strong survival benefit by inhibiting PI3 kinase gamma that combines very well with chemotherapy. And um, so we see, so, you know, one of the big issues is are microglia or macrophages derived from the bone marrow, the most important cell type, but we think they both are. And inhibiting PI3 kinase gamma affects both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, I think a more important question is if you had an ongoing neuroinflammatory disorder like Alzheimer's, would inhibiting this molecule be good or bad? We haven't, we don't know. And that's something we'll have to look for. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. I can see all the regenerative medicine potential here. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. Uh, the last question goes to Ezra. It took 12 weeks to generate the mutated peptides for immunization. That's besides the time required for sequencing bioinformatic analysis. By that time, the tumor is growing and it is possible that more mutations are required. Could it be the reason why some peptides didn't work? I, I suppose, uh, but we do a tumor biopsy um, uh, on, on treatment and the, we don't see a lot of new mutations in that sequencing. Uh, we have seen evidence of immune editing, so we've, we've lost some of uh, the mutations. We don't see a lot of new ones. Now we do see some new ones. And so the answer is, is maybe, but um, 
we don't we don't get a, 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 a tremendous amount of drift in terms of uh, the mutations and uh, both in number and, and in type. Uh, so it's possible. I, I, I don't think that that's a major mechanism of, of resistance. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think we've exhausted our viewers here. We had 149 people participating and we know that uh, more will participate or watch this on UCTV. Remember, you can email us any questions at uh, the stem cell program here at UC San Diego. Uh, you can see that uh, we're very interactive. We tend to collaborate a lot. Uh, we do want to solve some of the world's greatest problems, which to us is uh, how cancer evades the immune system and how do we rearm the immune system to attack cancer and give people really productive lives as Ezra and Judy have showed so effectively in uh, real time here. And so I'd like to thank everyone for participating, particularly Ezra Cohen, Judy Barner. Um, please uh, feel free to follow up with us if you have questions. And thank you again for your time. Thank you.